Good morning, or rather good afternoon, because it's 12 o'clock. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. Um, thank you so much to my fellow presenters from Native American Health Center's School-Based Health Center Department. I'm so honored to be co-presenting with you. Um, and thank you to all the School-Based Health Center folks for all the work that you do every day. Um, my name is Amy Ranger, and I'm the Director of Programs for the California School-Based Health Alliance. That's the folks that are putting on today's conference. Um, and I'll be presenting today on School-Based Health Centers 101. And we had a little bit of tech issues, so I'm just double checking that all is well, and it seems like it is. So, off we go. Um, of course, it has to be able to make the slides move. <laughs> So many problems. Let's try that again. Okay, now slides are moving. For those of you who don't know us, the California School Based Health Alliance, we are a statewide nonprofit that exists to serve as the backbone to the almost 300 school based health centers in California. So we help school districts and medical providers and behavioral health providers come together to launch new school based health centers. In fact, we're hoping that we will surpass 300 this year. Um, as well as supporting the school-based health centers that exist to help them serve more students, serve students better, and be more sustainable. So we have many, many, many resources, um, trainings, this conference, lots of written materials on our website, and we really want to help you all as school-based health center providers do the work that you do. Um, this workshop in particular is geared towards folks that are looking to start new school-based health centers, so we're hoping that today we can provide information that will help you do that um, if you're not already a member of our organization, please become one. Um, it's quite affordable and um, it gives you all kinds of great benefits, including lots of extra technical assistance from us. Our goals for today, for this particular workshop, are to help um, provide some tools to build collaborations between school districts, healthcare providers, and other community agencies to launch the school-based health center planning process, to start, talk about what some of those first steps might be, and what are some best practices in school-based health center and school integration. So, to start us off, I'm hoping that you all will add to the chat your name, your agency, and anything in particular that you are hoping to learn today. So take a minute just to do that, um, and we will try to steer our presentation towards the, um, the information that you guys want to get out of today. While you're doing that, I'm going to keep us going. Um, and Edzira or any of my co-presenters, let me know if we're having any technical difficulties with the chatting. So I'm gonna talk for um, about half an hour about um, existing school-based health centers in California and what we know about them. I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into money because I know that's often um, the first question that comes up when people say, you know, we'd love to have school-based health centers in our schools, but how in the world are we going to pay for it? Um, and then talk about the planning process um, and how you might structure a needs assessment, talk about some stakeholders and partnerships, and then, I'm going to dive just a little bit into best practices, and luckily, we have a big chunk of time to hear about best practices in action. Um, we asked our school-based health center partners from Native American health centers here in Oakland to present because they are really leading out in some of the best practices, particularly around school-based health center and school integration. Um, but they also have really strong medical, behavioral health, dental health, health education services at their school-based health centers. So we have four representatives from that team um, who are going to present to you, and that to me is the best part. So let's start with the beginning. Um, what is a school-based health center? Um, we get this question a lot because oftentimes what comes to mind is, you know, the school nurse. Um, in the school nurse's office, but actually school-based health centers are much more robust and um, interdisciplinary. So there's lots of different ways that they show up, mostly because they're trying to be responsive to their community need. So the services that they have are often geared towards what ages that they have in the school that they serve, whether or not they're serving the broader community and families, um, what partners they're involved with. So they all look really different, but 
we have to have some kind of definition. And so we say that a school-based health center um, delivers primary medical care plus something else. Um, sorry, we can see the chat. Okay, I think Tracy is helping solve that. Um, so uh, oftentimes there will be a medical provider um, and or a behavioral health provider. Often more and more there's dental providers health educators, community health outreach workers, um, integrated multidisciplinary services all coming together in one location. And then oftentimes they're in a school campus, but they can also be adjacent to or adjacent to multiple school campuses. Um, and sometimes we call those school linked. Um, they always serve students. Um, sometimes they serve broader than that. So they, um, at the most narrow, can be open to just sibling students and their siblings, sometimes other family members, and sometimes the broader community, really based on um, what ages of young people they can serve, whether they have a community entrance, and whether or not they um, have the capacity to, to serve a broader um, age range and a broader community. Um, and really, they promote school-wide health, and I'll talk about this more later, but I think one of the most exciting things about school-based health centers is their really broad definition of patient and their really broad definition of health. So unlike sort of, you know, traditional medical care where your patients are folks that come in to your door, um, school-based health centers often think of their population base as being the entire school and the teachers and the families and the broader community. So I think that's what's most amazing about them. Um, we also hear people call school-based health centers wellness centers, which is also great. Um, there isn't a standard definition for a school-based health center versus a wellness center. Uh, some districts and communities use wellness centers to mean that they're actually more focused on behavioral health than medical services, whereas other communities use wellness center to say, oh, it's more focused on medical as opposed to behavioral health. So um, those aren't used consistently throughout the state, but we, and we say that communities should use whatever language is going to work best for them. It's all the same thing and it's all really great. And I'm still having a hard time moving the slides. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's happening there. I will try sharing again. I don't know what's happening, but we will just keep going on. Um, let's try it this way. Okay, I'm gonna try it once more, and then if it's not letting me move slides forward, then I'm hoping maybe Tani can call at the beginning of the slides and advance them for me. But um, do you see? Um, a map of California. I'm hoping you do. <laughs> Tracy, maybe we do. We do. Yes, we, we do, Amy. Okay. I, I don't know what's happening with my computer, but thank you all for your patience. So um, we have 291 school based health centers in California right now. Um, <laughs> press forward. Um, uh, this shows the where they are located. Um, you can see Los Angeles has the most by far. I think they're up to 74, although don't quote me on that. Um, Alameda County also has lots. Um, and then primarily in urban areas, but we have seen a lot of growth in rural areas in the last couple of years. There's been some great growth in the Central Valley, um, lots and lots of growth in Fresno County, and, um, and some increased interest in the last couple of years from the Inland Empire, San Bernardino and Riverside counties. So that's really exciting. And here at CSHA, we'd really like to support you all wherever you are in the state. Um, to get school-based health centers into your communities. Um, we often say that, you know, there's 10,000 schools in California and only 300 school-based health centers. So we're really at the very beginning of the work that we want to do. Um, we do have some metrics for how we might envision where to start first. Um, it depending on the size of the school, the Medi-Cal or free and reduced lunch population, the sort of other available health care providers around, whether folks are in a health desert. Um, so if you, want, as, if you want to dig into that data with us more deeply, we're happy to do that. 
And look, my slides are advancing. Um, so what services are provided in the existing school-based health centers right now? This is what we know from the annual census we do. 85% um, of them have medical services, 70% have mental health, 65 have dental prevention, but you can see we jumped down and 35% have dental treatment, and that in particular grows more and more each year. 60% um, provide some kind of reproductive and sexual health, although that's a little bit of a misleading study because of course some of them only serve younger kids, like elementary school age, in which case they obviously wouldn't need reproductive and sexual health services. Um, and then 51% have youth engagement. Um, and, you know, in our ideal world, we would have 100% on all of these because we think the best practice in a school-based health center is to have as many kind of services woven together as possible. So who is served? So I mentioned this earlier, but to get more specific, 83% of school-based health centers actually serve the broader community. So it's not just the students, which I think is really interesting. Oftentimes that definition of community can be different. So as I mentioned earlier, it can be students and siblings or um, students and families, as opposed to just opening up to the whole community. But most, uh, you can see almost all serve something beyond just the students. And then in terms of school level served, about half are um, serve high school students, about a quarter serve elementary school students, and then another quarter serve either middle school or are mobile and school linked and therefore serve multiple schools. And then who runs school-based health centers? And this is really important because as you'll see when we get to the financing, um, the lead agency structure really is going to um, define what kind of billing and financing can support a school-based health center. So a little over half are run by community health centers, and most of those are FQHCs, so federally qualified health centers, um, which means that they are primarily billing Medi-Cal for and other kinds of insurance for their financing. Then um, a little over a quarter, 29%, are run by school districts. So they're mostly getting school Medi-Cal, um, and we can talk more about that as well. Um, and then a smaller minority are run by other kinds of organizations. So hospitals, um, the local health department, sometimes community-based mental health agencies or community-based youth development agencies. Um, so really, it's worth looking in your particular community to see what kinds of partners can come together to run the most robust and sustainable school-based health center. And the best school-based health centers, while they might have a lead agency that's one of these, are actually bringing together all these different partners. So you might be, for example, and, and Native American health centers can tell you more about this, but you might be have a lead agency as a federally qualified health center, but then you might bring in um, a community-based youth development organization and a community-based mental health organization to help provide services. So, how school-based health centers are financed. The main way um, is reimbursement through um, Medi-Cal, other health plans, Family Pact, which is, if you don't know, is the California um, carve-out of Medi-Cal for uh, pregnancy prevention, um, Child Health and Disability Prevention Program, which we call CH CD CHDP, um, which will provide um, sort of the in introduction to Medi-Cal in order to get vaccines and um, uh, well child checks, and then other contracts for mental health services. There's also often school district contributions, um, which often can happen in the, in, in the form less of finances and more about in-kind support of space and school nurses and utilities and other custodial services. Um, and then the sponsoring agencies, whether that's the FQHC or other agency, um, can also contribute or subsidize. And then many also get government and private grants. My slides have ceased. Oh, there we go. Um, so some quick considerations for developing sustainable school-based health center programs is that, we, and we, we feel pretty strongly about this, that, that school-based health center should serve all students at the school, even if they're uninsured, or enrolled in an insurance that does not reimburse the school-based health centers, and that they should not charge students or families of students. So a lot of the work that we do, the individual technical assistance work that we do with school-based health centers, and it's helping them figure out their billing structure so that they can bill for enough students that the students that they can't bill for can still come in, right? It's this no wrong door, open door act kind of model. So what we don't want to do is to have a school-based health center that says, well, if you have this kind of insurance, we're not going to see you. If you don't have insurance, we're not going to see you. Ideally, school-based health center can see anyone that comes in the door and is billing enough for the folks that do have insurance that they can cover the cost. 
That said, reimbursement rates often don't cover the soft costs, soft quote unquote costs. For example, the health education, the outreach, the case management, those costs aren't usually re reimbursable. And so you have to reimburse for the, the medical and sometimes behavioral health or dental costs in order to cover some of the soft costs and or supplement with you know, lead agency contributions or grants. Um, and we, I, I feel hesitant saying this, you know, definitively, but oftentimes we feel like we can help school-based health centers and, and, and they can get to a place where they feel like they're actually billing enough to sustain themselves or they have a, a sustainable model, right? They can pull together, braid together different funding streams and grants to feel like, okay, we are sustainable in the long run. However, there is this initial upfront cost of building out the school-based health center and that's a place where we often get stuck is how are we gonna get this initial, you know, somewhere between $200,000 to $2 million, depending on how big, what you're starting with, if you're renovating versus building from scratch, if you're gonna have a dental operatory. Um, you know, it can, it, there's a really a wide variation in cost. And so one question to be asking yourself is like, what are some possibilities in your community to get that initial investment, even if we feel like we can have a sustainable school-based health center in the long run? Um, so like I said, it's a really wide range. A way to make that initial investment cheaper is to convert classrooms, to use on-site portables, to think of buildings that are near the school. And, and this is really important in our rural areas, mobile vans that can serve multiple schools at the same time, especially if they're really small schools, because if you have a small school, your patient base isn't gonna be large enough to build a freestanding school-based health center unless you're serving also a wide population in the broader community. So we find in the rural areas with lots of small schools that it really can be helpful to have a mobile van that maybe is, you know, at this elementary school on Monday and then this middle school on Tuesday. Um, and in terms of how folks have gotten the money to actually start the building, um, school modernization or construction grants, local bond measures with school construction allocations, facilities grants to clinics and hospitals, and then joint use agreements between cities and districts. Um, so jumping into planning, um, it is really important to um, have sort of a, a, a really intentional planning process and to get patient input. And we've seen really amazing examples of this sort of youth-led participatory research and having young people, especially in high school, but even in middle school and elementary, come together to say like, okay, what do we as young people, as patients, as students, what do we think needs to happen in our school-based health center? Um, so we have lots of tools to help you um, create that planning process and be really intentional about getting that input. Um, it's also important to discuss why it's needed, um, to do some kind of needs assessment and gather data, and I can tell you about some data sources in a second, and then determine the best model, because that's going to help lead you to what services you need and what um, and who who's going to be your best lead agency. So yeah, some key questions you might be asking are, who will the school health center serve? What's going to be the services and staffing model? How are you going to build out the facilities? What are you starting with? What's going to be your funding plan? And how are you going to have coordination between the agencies? Some great existing data sources for the needs assessment are um, the California Healthy Kids Survey, the free and reduced price lunch rates, um, Medi-Cal rates, and the uninsured rates, the county public health indicators, and attendance dropout and school discipline rates. Um, and again, these are existing data sources that you can pull from to help figure out what services are gonna be most helpful in your school. And then partnerships. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to bring together as many people as you can um, to integrate into the school and to integrate all these different service lines. So we encourage folks to think really creatively, um, you know, to think beyond just one community health center. Think about the community-based organizations, the municipalities, the public health department, the mental health providers, um, and that ideally that those would all be integrated together and integrated into the school. Um, I just want to underline here this idea of mental and behavioral health. Um, something I often say is that 
whereas in a regular medical provide medical providing setting people often think about the medical services as being you know 90 percent of the pie um, and mental health is this other little piece but what we've seen in school-based health centers is that when you're really trying to be uh, responsive to the needs of the community that actually for adolescents mental and behavioral health is primary right that they're mostly medically healthy that they do need sexual and reproductive health services um, and some you know ongoing primary care but if you're really tapping into the need the deepest need is around mental and behavioral health and so you might think about whereas in a regular medical clinic you might have you know 10 doctors and one integrated behavioral health clinician in a school-based health center maybe you want you know one nurse practitioner there for four days a week but you want two therapists you want an lcsw and then an intern like really thinking creatively how to build out that part of it um, so just to sort of explain what it might look like in terms of how the school-based health center staff and the school staff could come together, um, that school-based health center staff would have a coordinator, the medical staff, the behavioral health staff, and the sponsor agency staff, like the front desk, the medical assistants, um, the uh, billing staff, all those folks. Then the school would have their own investment through the principal and the school administrators and the teachers, because you really want those folks to be bought in and excited about the the school based health center as well. And then the people that are sort of in the middle, um, usually employed by the school district, but really critical to the school based health center functioning are the school nurse, the school counselor, and any kind of like health assistant. And just a real quick shout out to school nurses because we know that they work so hard um, that it's so great to have a school nurse involved in your planning process from the beginning and thinking about how they might serve in the school based health center and as part of the school based health center to do some care coordination care coordination, some triage to serve as the liaison to the school, to be a champion for the school based health center and to educate the staff on why a school based health center is helpful. Um, and just some, some quick best practices in coordination between the school and the, the clinic staff. Um, it's really important to have a strong MOU, a memorandum of understanding, um, just to get at some of the questions that might come up. Um, you know, what are the hours? Who are the staff? How do consents work? What are the, what's the school-based health center staff agreeing to vis-a-vis -vis the school? Um, there's so many parts of that and we have some sample MOUs for you to for look, look at as well. Um, having a regular partner meeting to come together to hash things out when there's um, questions. Um, coordination of services team, that's a best practice in schools in general that hopefully you all already know about, but the idea of having one place where all the services providers come together to talk about specific students that need support. So a way to say like, okay, here's what's happening with this particular student, who's handling them, what do they need, what other um, what other support and, and making sure that every young person gets sort of assigned to someone to follow up, every young, young person who needs any kind of support so that no one is falling through the cracks and there's no duplication of services. And there's an amazing um, cost toolkit as well um, that we have on our website and that we can uh, forward out to you as well. Um, and then annual or even more often um, outreach to teachers and staff. Um, explaining the data of the school-based health center, why there's value in, because uh, oftentimes, you know, teachers are like, hey, you're pulling kids out of class, which is hurting their academics. But if we help them to see um, the benefits that young people are getting from coming to their medical appointment or coming to their behavioral health appointment and how we might be preventing a pregnancy or helping to address a trauma or, you know, filling a, a cavity, they can see the value of that um, and what the data, the, the outcome data is of that. Um, and then in terms of student access, uh, a, a really quick tip that makes such a difference is getting those parental consents at the school registration process. Because for many services, obviously there are some services that can be provided without parental consent, which are around um, minor consent and reproductive and sexual health. But there are many services that do need parental consent and it can be so hard to get those forms signed. So if you can use school registration as a chance to just, you're just one step, the school health center is just one step along the registration process, and it's a chance for parents to understand what services are provided, understand what can be provided under minor consent versus parental consent, and get those registrations signed, I mean, get those consent signs. Also, just a plan on how students access services. Do they need a pass? Is there a gate? Is there, can, what kind of, like, who needs to know? How do they get not marked absent? All those sort of pieces. Um, is the clinic physically accessible? Do teachers know how and when and why to excuse students from class? 
and how do we maintain student confidentiality as they access. Also, just another quick tip is um, teachers and staff have to get these TB tests, which can be such a pain for them. So if the clinic can offer TB tests, that's a great way to get some, some goodwill. Consent and confidentiality is often one of the stickiest points. Um, and for those of you who are new to this world, you might not know that there are laws that govern how healthcare providers can share information called HIPAA. And there are laws about how education staff can share information called FERPA. And those two laws do not exactly align. And so, and the cultures of those laws and those settings often don't align. Um, so I think it can be um, surprising to folks that that is a place of contention or confusion once a school-based health center opens and the school is saying, well, why can't you tell me that, you know, X, Y, and Z about these students? And the clinic is saying, well, why are you asking me that's confidential information? So just getting really clear on what the laws are, what can be shared, what can't be shared, why, and the fact that everyone really has the best interest of the students at heart. It's just that oftentimes what that looks like can look different based on the culture. And we actually have a primer, a, a you know, piece of paper primer that's a, basically a book. It's like 50 pages long. But we've tried recently to take all that information and put it onto an interactive website. So if you go to our website, um, you can find a sort of a website embedded in a website specifically about consent and confidentiality and helping folks navigate HIPAA and FERPA. Um, and just really quickly, what makes school based health centers as effective as possible as possible is um, this enhanced access to health care. So it's really about getting kids the care that they wouldn't get otherwise. Um, and that can be primary care, especially for folks that are um, uninsured or underinsured, but it's also the sexual and reproductive health care that wouldn't be gotten because of transportation barriers or stigma or embarrassment. Um, and also the mental health care that, that wouldn't be accessed because of lack of sort of community mental health care accessibility. Um, also prevention and population health. Um, I can talk more about that in a second. Some really intensive support for the highest needs students, you know, looking at that, that tiered system um, that many of you are familiar with, the, the multi-tiered systems, um, and making sure that the highest need kids are getting really intensive support. Also supporting the school's academic achievement mission, right? Then that we put school based health centers in kids partially because we want them to be successful academically. And if they're getting the medical care and the dental care and the behavioral health care that they need, that will actually help them be more academically successful. And then integration into the, the larger healthcare system, and this is obviously a bigger topic as well, but how are we, if if kids do have primary care providers in the broader community, how are we linking that clinical information back to them? And this to me is the most exciting part is like, how is it broader? How is it more exciting? How is it more robust than, you know, sort of traditional health care? How are we thinking about public health? Um, so some school-based health centers and some of our favorite school-based health centers can see almost all the student body, right? Like if there's a thousand kids at that school, they have, you know, laid their eyes on all thousand of them. And one of the ways they do that are these ongoing and mass screenings. So they're bringing in groups of kids and doing really quick visits with them just to say like, do you have a medical home? Do you have a dentist? When's the last time you've been? Do you have insurance? Are you up to date on your vaccines? And then even trying to figure out, do you have any unmet sexual reproductive health needs? Do you have any unmet behavioral health needs? Is there anything hard happening in your life that you're not talking about? So doing this sort of like broader screening um, of the student body to see what they might need and what they might not be getting. Um, also STI testing. We've seen some really creative like come in and get your chlamydia or your or your HIV test and um, you know get lunch for the day or, or, or we're going to have a party with a DJ and you can come in and like have, have giveaways and do something fun and sort of destigmatizing and and making STI and HIV testing this fun event. Um, lots of focus on social determinants of health, um, giving away clothing, school supplies, holiday food. We have a lot of school-based listeners that actually have a food pantry embedded in them. Um, all kinds of health fairs, wellness campaigns, staff wellness activities. This is actually wonderful when we see it, and we've seen this a lot 
during um, COVID is how school-based health centers can actually serve as a wellness hub for school staff because, you know, both in terms of physical health, um, during non-COVID times, we see things like yoga classes and, um, and putting healthy food in the teacher's lounge and doing meditation moments in the morning, things like that. Um, but also in terms of their mental health and dealing with stress and, and dealing with the stress of distance learning, how can school-based health centers be a resource for those school staff? Um, and then youth engagement. So let having young people be the leaders and the voice in their work, this happens lots of different ways in lots of different schools. We often see peer health educators, we see peer counselors, um, we see youth advocates or research teams to help launch school-based health centers. Um, some of the best school-based health centers have youth advisory boards to help inform the school-based health center to say like, we need more of this or less of this, or people don't understand confidentiality, or they don't understand the different kinds of birth control, and this is what we need. And then health career pipeline projects. So how do we serve as a resource, as the clinic, how do we serve so that young people who want to have careers in health care, whether that's medical or behavioral health or medical assistant or dental work, I mean, um, how do we help them get to that goal and use what we have to do that? Um, and lastly, I want to talk for a little bit about the impact of COVID on school-based health centers. Um, I think for, for those of you who are still in the beginning of your planning process, I think by the time you actually open a school-based health center, which can often take multiple years, um, this will obviously be a really different landscape. Um, but just really quickly, I think some opportunities that have come up around this are that a lot of school-based health centers have pivoted to telehealth, which is actually amazing because that will serve as a, a, a resource for sustainability in the long term. So there's lots of different ways that school-based health centers already were using telehealth in small ways like having it linked to psychiatric services or derm, um, dermatological services. Um, but this, now that we have this sort of telehealth structure built up, school-based health centers can use that even more robustly. So if they have a, a nurse practitioner in sort of the bigger school in their community, but they want to telehealth that person into a smaller school, they could do that. Um, you know, it's, it really just creates a lot more freedom and expansiveness um, to use telehealth services in the future. Um, also, people are doing really incredible virtual youth engagement, um, figuring out how to still have that youth leadership, how to have those peer counselors um, support other young people or have the Instagram health education campaign or especially in this time where young people might even be more isolated or more depressed or using more substances, how to help reach, how to help them reach each other. Um, some school-based health centers are offering COVID testing and hopefully will be able to, when we have a vaccine, offer COVID vaccines. Um, they've often served as even more of a school and family resource hub during this time when, when families need more support with basic needs around housing or food um, or connection to schools or how to do online learning. So they've been able to do that. And this time has really brought about greater awareness of the need for school-based health centers. Like, I think we've seen a lot of more media coverage of, of this being a solution to some of the problems that have become clear during this time. Um, there have also been challenges, of course. Um, telehealth isn't always easy, um, as I think some of the other presenters in the other workshops today have talked about, that there are limitations of privacy and technology, um, and so it is sometimes harder to reach young people this way. Um, of course, there's a deeper need and more trauma in the populations that we're serving. Um, and then there have been financial burdens on the school-based health centers um, that have either had to shift staff away or um, have had decreased billing. Um, and we're really hopeful that those will, um, will get resolved as, as we emerge out of this time. Um, I think my last slide, which is perfect timing, is um, that we at CSHA, like as I said, we really see our mission as to support you all in launching school-based health centers and improving your school-based health centers. So we would love, obviously not right this second, but when everyone is re-backed open, to bring you to tour school-based health centers that are in your region, um, to learn about potential partnerships, um, to get help in some of these things, obviously we can do in, um, virtually, to get help in selecting um, the model that's gonna best fit the needs of your community. Um, we can give guidance on how to create a planning committee. And then we have a whole startup toolkit that we can send out to you. So please, please, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to do this free of charge. We really wanna help you all do the work that you want to do. 
And with that, I will pass the slides to my partners at Native American Health Centers. Um, at Ziri, Jennifer, Theresia, and Tani all work in the same agency that runs multiple school-based health centers. We have our um, medical uh, services for representative behavioral health services and then administration so hopefully you can hear um, a multidisciplinary approach to how they all do their work hi good afternoon thank you amy for all of that it's always exciting to rehear all of it even though we're already still in the work uh, so tani if you can go ahead and screen share our part of the second section. So as Amy mentioned, my name is Etsy Rodriguez and I am the Director of School-Based Healthcare with Native American Health Center. Um, thank you for being here and learning more about health centers and I hope you all find today's uh, presentation inspiring to go start off your own school-based health center or start the process of that and start brainstorming with others. Tani, are you able to screen share? I am not. It says it's disabled. So I'm not sure if Amy, you have to be the one to do so. Okay, try again. Amy might be able to give permission. Oh, here we go. Okay, now I have permission. Thank you, everyone. So just a little bit to start and kind of just going with what Amy was saying. I think one of the great things about school-based health centers that we've been able to see in our work uh, is our ability to really support our students and our families at our school sites um, in offering full scope medical services, full scope integrated healthcare services, right? Unlike many other traditional places where you might go to Kaiser and you're only seeing your uh, medical provider that day. And if you know you need to go see the dentist, they'll, you know, you'll, you have to go to your own dental provider. Um, the beauty of school-based health centers is that we have so much integration within our school sites. And so when we were thinking about what can we really present to really capture what school-based health center is and the positives of school-based health centers, we really are thinking about, we wanted to share with you our integrated health and wellness uh, systems and framework, and hopefully you all can learn from that. So for today's agenda, we will be reviewing a little bit of our model, sharing a little bit about kind of the differences where Amy was saying, whether you're a lead site, whether you're a partner agency, because we do have those different models within our department. Uh, we'll be able to hear directly from our staff working, right, one-on-one -on -one with our patients, our medical provider, our behavioral health provider, to really highlight how we integrate with each other as an interdisciplinary team and how we also work and collaborate with our school partners, our community partners, to really make sure that our patients are getting the best services that they can and that there aren't gaps in their healthcare. Um, and of course, the important part, how do you support integrated healthcare within your school-based health system? How do you create a system of support for your providers and your teachers and your principals and all the other individuals that may be associated with your health center in order to, once again, provide the best service to your students? Um, and of course, what are the best practices and lessons learned because things don't come easy. It's a lot of trial and error. So to start off with a little bit about Native American Health Center, Native American Health Center is a federally qualified health center serving the Bay Area Native population and underserved communities since 1972. So we do have a long standing history in Oakland. Um, our primary health center is located um, in the Fruitvale District, and we do offer medical, dental, behavior health services, and as well as traditional cultural practices. Um, and it was back in 1993 uh, that Native American Health Center actually decided to partner with another agency, Alameda Family Services, to start its first school-based health center at Alameda High School. So our agency does have a very long-standing history with school-based health centers. 
and if we could just switch this slide to me, thank you. Uh, so we started, like I mentioned, in 1993, um, and from then now we have eight school-based health centers across three school districts. So we have a school, most of our schools are in Oakland Unified School District, but we do have some school-based health center sites within Alameda Unified School District and San Leandro Unified. All of our sites do offer medical, behavior health, health education, youth development services, all the great things that Amy was talking about. And five out of our eight sites also include on-site dental services. In terms of our population out of our eight sites, very much like the data that Amy presented, most of our school-based health center sites are within middle schools and high schools. However, we do have one site that is a primary site and that site serves kindergarten through 12th grade. So we do suit everybody from that school. Um, and we also have two sites that are more school linked. That's a term that we don't hear as often. We often hear the school based because the school based health centers are based within the school. But there is also a model of school linked school-based health centers, which means that the schools, the health center may not be necessarily within the campus. However, they may be right next door to the school, across the street to the school, where we still have access to serve that population of students. But we, their accessibility also makes it um, available for community members as well, too. So we, at some of our sites, we do see our adults as well. So in terms of the model that we have with the Native American Health Center, we have two models of school-based health centers. We have one model in which Native American Health Center is the lead agency. And so that means everybody that is housed at that school-based health center is a Native American Health Center employee. Um, each of our school-based health center sites has a program manager and a program coordinator. And these are really strong positions that help support the daily operations of the health center. Um, and within their roles after, afterwards, we have our nurse practitioner who comes in on a rotating basis to each school-based health center site. We have a behavioral health clinician, and we also have our dental and dental assistant team. Most of our sites are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Um, and it really just depends on your staffing availability of how often you're able to provide services. At our sites, like I mentioned, we do have a rotating nurse, behavior health clinician, and dentist. So our hours vary of, of week of service depending on the school site. So we usually offer 16 to 24 hours of medical services, 8 to 16 hours of dental services a week, and then 16 hours of dental services. Um, and all these positions are supported by Native American Health Center leadership. Now, I will say this has changed a little bit in COVID because, uh, you know, not all school sites are open, but we are still working really hard and we have the team still working together. On the okay. second model, yes. Just, I think, I can't totally see the bottom. I think it repeats dental services twice and probably is supposed oh, to be health services. Sorry, correct. The other model of school-based health centers that we do have is uh, partnering with the lead agency. And so our partners, we do have three partnerships with behavioral health lead agencies where they, and where they have the lead of the health center. They house um, their programmatic staff and then they partner with us and we provide the nurse practitioner to be able to perform their medical services, their dental provider to go ahead and do the dental services on those days. So there is a variety of ways that you can build school-based health centers and this is just two examples of how that can happen. And for those who may have not seen what a school-based health center looks like, um, I know usually during this time frame we like to do school tours and unfortunately that option is not available at this time. But this is what uh, one of our United for Success school-based health center looks like. So we have very much like the front, you know, a lot of times when students go in, they're like, wow, this is, this actually looks like a health center and they're expecting a school nurse or just a smaller office. So it's really great um, to be able to see how people react to what a school-based health center looks like. And so one of the great things that I've mentioned earlier and Amy's mentioned so much is the integration of services 
that we are able to offer. We really do believe in a patient-centered approach in really making sure that all of our patients' needs are met, whether it's health needs, behave, uh, behavior health, um, dental, whether it's food, housing. We tend to see that a lot at our schools. And so how do we really work together to make sure that a child grows up healthy um, in making sure that all of their needs are being met. And so we work together really strongly as a team. And I think it's one of the best things that we have that we're able to work together um, to make sure that everything is, oh, sorry, I, can't, I got distracted by a chat. Um, but, uh, sorry. Uh, that the integration is really happening. And the integration is really, really key. And I will say not only integration between the team at the school-based health center, but the integration that we have within the schools that we work at. And I, I know a lot of the times we think of the financial and the financial sustainability piece. And so the integration with schools is really, really important to make sure that we are increasing patient volume if that is a concern for some school sites. Um, making sure that we build those collaborative partnerships to really make sure that we're able to connect all of the resources and that we're still able to create patient volume. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Jen and she's going to be able to go ahead and provide a little bit of insight into how we integrate within our medical services. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Bryson Alderman. I'm a family nurse practitioner. Um, I've worked in a variety of settings, but I'm very happy to say I've been with um, Native school-based practice, I think for five years now. It's a real privilege and pleasure to work with this team. And great to be with you all today to share some stories about what care actually looks like from a medical point of view for the kiddos that we serve and the communities that we serve as a whole. So I think the best way to do that is to do a case study of what um, care can look like. Um, there are many stories, of course, but this is a good one because it, um, this patient actually needed a variety of our services and it sort of shows how that rolls out in, in, uh, over time with any given patient. So this patient is a 15-year-old African-American male in 10th grade. He came to us in August of last year. He was sent to us actually referred by the school um, front office because his um, vaccines were inadequate for um, school participation. And so they sent him over to us to get some vaccines. He walked in the door thinking he was going to be there for 10 minutes. Uh, get a poke or two and march back into his life. Um, but he had no vaccine records. He had no California immunization records because he had just moved from out of state. And so we needed to back up and do a little more work on what his story was. So he just moved from Michigan. He's living with his aunt and cousin in, um, and his aunt has taken guardian responsibility for him. Um, and it comes up in our conversation. He's also had no regular medical care in the past few years. So it's time for uh, a well child check for him, a good preventive care look where we do a physical exam. We look at the social and emotional uh, aspects of his life, all the social determinants of health, do a thorough vaccine review and all that. So um, next slide. So then, um, so I, we sort of talked about that with him, but he said, uh, I'm not signed up for all that today. That's too much. Plus I have a science class going on right now and we're dealing with some really intense subject matter that I can't miss. I need to get back to class, which is great to hear and totally fine. So um, we agreed he would come back for his well child check, but we always look at their screeners. We have an ex extensive social determinants of health screener, a um, uh, bunch of forms that all the kids do. And um, we always make sure to look at those whenever we first see a kid for any red flags. And actually with this patient, there were two things that were notable that we needed to deal with right away. One was that his depression screen was showing a pretty substantial level of depression. And most concerning was that he was also showing um, a fair, a, a good level of suicidal ideation, which is obviously quite uh, concerning. And he also answered yes to our uh, food insecurity questions. So we needed to get at that right away. We did 
uh, a Columbia suicide risk assessment, which is a validated tool to um, assess suicide risk. He actually was at low current risk, but in general, still a concerning kiddo because he actually has had a suicide attempt a couple of years ago. He had a psychiatric hospitalization and since then has had no follow up. He's not on any medications and he doesn't have any current psychiatric care. The food insecurity question, um, it's always great to clarify because it turns out what he was telling us is that he doesn't like his aunt's cooking, which often happens with kids. Interpreting the meaning of the questions can be very personal. So obviously that's not an emergency. Food is plentiful in his household. Um, but obviously the most important thing to do was to refer him to our behavioral health clinician um, for an urgent intake to start to get his depression and suicidality assessed and, and cared for. So we agreed he'd come back in a week, next slide, um, for uh, a well child visit. He was fine with that plan. By that time, he'd had a successful intake with our behavioral health provider. She did a great job of establishing rapport with him. She also concurred that he's at low current risk for suicide, which was reassuring, um, but that he does need care and needs support and her care would be ongoing to him and that we would coordinate care between us. His vaccine history was still unknown. He hadn't managed to get any of his own records. We were never gonna get any from the state. So this is often a time when we have a conversation with the kid and say, so here are the choices. We can work hard on getting your records, um, which is going to take some engagement from you and your parents probably, or we can start from zero and um, just start giving you all the vaccines as if you've never had any. And most kids are, when they hear that that's the alternative choice, they're pretty motivated to find their vaccine records, often takes calls home to um, parents and guardians to unearth those um, records, but that's the, the choice that he went with was to try and unearth those records. So after a full intake with him and a well child check that day, um, here are the diagnoses that, he, that we ended up charting. Um, this is relevant for billing. It's also relevant for our um, clinical care. This is how we track our clinical care, both uh, among medical providers and our medical and behavioral health providers share these charts so that we can be in the loop with each other about what's going on with any given patient. So well child visit um, code is standard for anybody who gets a well child check. This patient also had hypermobile patellas kneecaps um, on both knees and it causes him a bunch of pain. So we needed to do some work on helping get him some orthopedic services. He has major depression with uh, suicidal ideation. We discovered that he had a dental care need. He hasn't had any dental care in the last few years. And we did the full, uh, now instead of just a quick uh, red flag review of his screeners, we did a full review of all the screeners, food insecurity, depression, the staying healthy assessment, a PTSD screen. Um, there's a school-based health center teen screen that we use. Um, and uh, also some questions that are not validated uh, sort of nationally in a, in a clinical trial way, but that are relevant to our local population. So for example, we also have a question in our screener that relates to um, assessing risk for commercial sexual exploitation of children. We also do a drug and alcohol uh, screening, a craft screening for all our kids. Next slide. So from a medical point of view, our ongoing work with him, um, you can, yeah, there you go, looks like uh, work to update his vaccine records, lab orders that we would normally do for any well child check, and also for um, important things to look at around depression. Also a referral to orthopedics. We have a local children's hospital that we refer to um, for that, and so we got that going. For dental, we referred him to our dental program um, to make sure that he got a, an assessment and treatment. We didn't have, we don't have any on-site dental at the particular clinic that he was at, but our program staff does a great job of trying to, uh, of working with the kids to identify which dental location is most convenient for them and getting them scheduled into and working around the logistics of um, how to get there so they can get their dental assessment. 
Our behavioral health staff person continued to work with him in a very regular way. She and I were in very close contact, um, sharing uh, charts back and forth with, you, with each other, um, having live case consultations where we discussed what was going on with him so that we can make sure our care is uh, really integrated. And then of course, the student is new to California and has no health insurance, as Amy talked about in the beginning. Um, so our program staff is really good, has, has gotten really good by necessity um, at working with families to run the labyrinthian process of getting signed up for Medi-Cal so, um, so that our programs are sustainable and we can bill for all the care that we're giving to this patient. So next slide. Um, so what happened with this kid over time? Um, by January, it became clear that it probably made sense to um, help this kid out with some uh, um, depression medication. His depression was interrupting his function and his ability to engage socially and academically. And so we worked together closely with his parent, his mom remotely and his guardian here in California um, to make sure that there was buy-in and consent and understanding for starting him on an SSRI with a dose escalation, which we did. Um, we also continued to work with the family and him to um, manage the complexities of getting to his orthopedic appointments and his physical therapy appointments, because that's very challenging for families where parents are working and struggling to, um, to meet the needs of their kiddos. Um, and then, of course, so that care was all sort of going on in the sort of way it used to go on. And then, of course, in March, COVID happened. And um, I have to say, I feel like our school-based team did an amazing job of pivoting really quickly, moving all services to telehealth. And in one regard, our patient was very well set up because he was well integrated into our care already. And so moving him into telehealth, he had established relationships already, both with medical and behavioral health, which continued. But on the other hand, the realities of what it meant to shelter in place disconnected him from all of his support systems, basically, whatever support his medical and, and behavioral health appointments were providing to him but also um, his social life, school life, his intellectual engagement at school, exercise, and even time outside. He ended up um, really just spending all of his time in his home, not going outside at all, and becoming more and more and more depressed to a point where the behavioral health clinician and I got very concerned that it was really clear that this patient was not safe um, and needed a higher level of care. And so uh, we talked, the behavioral health clinician and I talked a lot and did a lot of coordination. The behavioral health clinician in particular did a lot of work with him to help him have a voluntary admission into our um, inpatient psychiatric facility, which for us is Willow Rock in Oakland. Once he was there, um, which was a very good outcome because he was, he was extremely unsafe where he was, we worked to coordinate and we continued to work to coordinate care with his family and the inpatient facility. We coordinated care with them while he was in, inpatient with them to understand what was going on and what his needs were and made sure to have a really good discharge plan for him when he was coming out so that there would be no gap in services. So by July, he came back to our telemed services and it has continued with us we do, we continue to do his medication management, his general primary care, um, and, uh, and uh, all, all by telemed. Um, so he's stable, he's in a better situation, <laughs> um, and we'll continue to care for him as, as long as he needs it. Um, and I'm really happy about that. So now I'm going to pass it on to Theresia, I think, who's going to get into really talking about what our behavioral health services look like. Great. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Theresia Oros. I'm an LCSW licensed clinical social worker, and I've been working in school-based mental health in for different organizations um, in different roles a little bit for about seven years. And I've been with Native American Health Center, school-based health centers for three years. 
And um, if you have questions while I'm talking, please feel free to put them in the chat. It is always nice to just get a little bit of interaction and clarify in the moment. And I think was said there will be a Q&A after all of us have spoken also. Um, so I work at two of our sites. We have um, the behavioral health clinician that Jen was mentioning is our other clinician. There's two of us. And as um, was mentioned, I'm, I'm two days at each site. And I bring that up because as Amy Ranger mentioned, um, mental health or behavioral health, those are different, but some somewhat interchangeable terms um, is there's a very high need for that. There's a lot of referrals. There's a lot of um, interest in that usually. And having someone dedicated at the site, a behavioral health person who can be there throughout the week to keep building the partnerships, the relationships with all of the different school partners and the students is, is really helpful and important, I think. So I don't recommend being split across sites. Um, and um, it does allow us to provide more of those services at, at because we have our medical providers who are seeing students across sites, which works really well, I think, in the medical model. Um, and they often have a lot of referrals to us. So the part I wanted to share about was all the different places we get referrals and how we coordinate care. Um, so I get referrals from COS, which is the coordination of services team. So at the school, that is the team that will receive requests for support in different ways and they try to figure out who's the best match for that. At most of, at most or all of my school sites, um, the mental health providers include me at the, at the health center. Um, and then there's also usually a specialty mental health provider, someone who works for a community mental health agency who is, um, works more embedded in the school. And so those agencies around us are Fred Finch, um, East Bay Agency for Children, Seneca Center, Lincoln. Um, so they are considered, um, they have a smaller caseload usually for more higher need or more intensive cases. And then behavioral health in the health center is considered more mild to moderate is what they call it. Um, and usually I see a lot more students um, often for just a few visits or a shorter term. And then also sometimes for a longer term um, amount of treatment or care, episode of care. And um, so I get referrals from costs when they decide that we're the best fit. Sometimes that has to do with the need, if it's mild to moderate or moderate to severe. Some that sometimes it has to do with language. I speak Spanish and we do um, often have Spanish speaking students or if it really needs someone who's gonna be able to talk to the family, that might be important. Occasionally school staff will directly refer to me because they just, we're feeling nervous about a student or they already have a relationship with me. So they'll just come drop in to talk about a student and then I'll check in with cost about it. Um, one example of that is a, a teacher who had a close relationship with a student who was very hesitant to um, talk to, had never talked to a therapist before and but trusted this teacher and was sharing um, about substance use and some other pretty sensitive topics with that teacher. And the teacher was able to do what um, we actually call a, a warm handoff, it was her own version of a warm handoff where she came and introduced the student to me and helped him feel more comfortable with me. Um, that is what we do internally. I, I think we've been throwing out this idea of warm handoff and in case you don't know what that is, is it's just the idea of making a warm introduction. And so if our medical provider is meeting with a young person for a reproductive health visit, and in that visit, they, um, it comes up in the conversation or as part of their screening that they might have need to talk to a behavioral health provider, then they'll say, hey, we actually, we have someone, her name's Theresia, she works here, she's just across the hall right now, could I introduce you to her? so that you can meet her and see if you're willing to come back and talk to her. And um, often that can go a long way to helping um, the young person feel comfortable to actually come back in return. Um, 
and we can just meet and hi nice to meet you and so it's just gonna be this warm way instead of just scheduling the appointment and we'll see you next week and that can make us all a little bit more nervous and so we love um, getting to do that and that can go both ways so if i am meeting with a young person who has a medical need i might be able to say hey the medical provider's here can i just introduce you briefly so you know who you're going to see when you come in later and um, that can do a lot to help um, young people feel more comfortable and so medical providers um, i get a lot of referrals from medical providers as jen was saying they screen um, for a lot of a variety of needs and then ask if they're already getting care somewhere or if they're in need or interested in care. Often, um, young people will decline to talk to a therapist for different reasons, and they'll continue to get monitored maybe by the medical provider about how they're doing in their mental health. And sometimes later, after a few of those visits, they'll change their mind or they will see me around and say, okay, yeah, maybe I will try talking to her. Um, and one example of a a case right now is someone um, last school year who was in the clinic for a sports physical with our nurse practitioner and during her sports physical shared about some family stressors that were happening relationship problems that were happening with her father and was offered to her to talk to behavioral health and she said okay she's willing to try it and, and she came to meet with me and um for the rest of that school year i was able to support her first with the family relationship stressors that were happening, but then also as she was transitioning out of high school, she actually ended up going to UC Berkeley and had a lot of um, challenges with that transition and believing in herself, being able to go to that school. She was studying chemistry and um, through the summer and now as she's transitioning into school, I've been able to keep meeting with her. We'll probably be wrapping up soon because she's doing really well as she's starting college now. Um, but a lot of that is because of telehealth. So I, I can't say enough about how amazing telehealth is in increasing access to care. Because usually what was happening before, we could not get any billing, we could not bill insurance for a phone call visit. We could only do a face-to-face -face visit is what we could get reimbursed from insurance for. And because of COVID, that was changed. We could suddenly, we can have these visits by phone or video. Surprisingly, not surprisingly, but a lot of young people don't want to do video with me. They prefer phone, even though video I wish for often. Um, but we're able to continue seeing students who would have fallen off care because they weren't no longer able to come in for visits. We usually have a big drop um, during school breaks, which often is when students really need visits actually during the holidays. Um, a lot can happen for students where they need support, but they're not able to come in face to face for visits. So now that we can do phone call visits, it's done. Uh, it's really amazing and in increasing access um, So the student I'm mentioning, even as she's transitioning to college, she wouldn't have been able to come in probably for face to face visits, but I'm able to continue supporting her in that transition through telehealth, which has been really helpful. Another example is, I think towards the top of that, is self-referrals. So a lot of students or family members will just drop into the clinic and ask, is there counseling or therapy? And so they'll just directly request it themselves. Um, one student who did that had been coming to the health center for maybe three years getting medical care and dental care, but she had never engaged in mental health services before. She'd been offered it multiple times in her life and always declined it. Um, she was even involved, had to um, had a pretty severe abuse case that she had to give testimony in court about and had been offered therapeutic support um, in years earlier, always said no. And I believe through just being familiar with the health center, trusting our program manager, um, trusting our providers, eventually just decided for herself, just self-requested, can I'd like to talk to the counselor? And the first thing she said to me is like, I don't want to talk, to, I've never done this before. I don't know if I trust talking to you, but I want to give it a try because um, I would like to feel better. And 
she, this was also her senior year, so I supported her through her senior year. And then she still was, wanted the care. She said she wanted to keep seeing me after she graduated. We're able to keep seeing alumni or community members, even once they're not a student anymore, which is great. Um, but similarly, because she couldn't make it in for face-to-face -face visits, had fallen off care. So once um, COVID happened, I, I reached out to her to see how she was doing. And she started care again by telehealth. And that has been um, very timely and useful for her because she was in need of that. It had been about a year since I had last seen her. Um, and yeah, so that's been great. There's quite a few students I was able to reconnect with through telehealth or alumni or students who were transferred from our school or different reasons. A, another one that I, another example I love is from dental provider will refer to us. So our dental provider is very you know, caring person who talks to her patients and she had a young person that she was noticing um, would look like she felt down. And I think the student was sharing with her about family stressors. So the dental dentist came to me and said, hey, can I refer her to you? Like, how does this work? And she was able to introduce her to me and, and that student started meeting with me also. And so that was a way to access care through dental visits that might not have happened otherwise if I hadn't been right there on site as part of the integrated team. Um, it also happens a lot from our, our site manager and our, our front desk staff, who we call our program coordinator. Students will come in, get really strong relationships with them and chat with them. So one example of that was a, I think she was maybe an eighth grader. I work at middle school and high school sites. So ages, um, grades six through 12. And she, uh, eighth grader had been coming in during her lunchtime. She wasn't spending her lunch out with the other students. She would come and sit in the health center during her lunchtime um, and talk to our front desk staff when she was available. And so our front desk person came and talked to me and said, she, you know, I'm a little concerned what's going on that she doesn't, she said she doesn't have friends to talk to during lunch. So she did a warm handoff. She introduced her to me one day when she was in there during lunch. And I chatted with her for a little bit and then we scheduled a regular appointment and I was able to see her for the rest of that school year and support her with some of the things that were happening socially and her um, nervousness around peers. And yeah, great, next slide. Um, I also make referrals out to all of the people I mentioned. So sometimes I can't meet the need of what the student needs. They might need a higher level of care, which is um, especially mental health is one of the um, names of that. And sometimes what's great is I can do it inside of our school. So I can refer to that specialty mental health provider I mentioned, the other agencies that are doing um, moderate to severe symptoms of mental health that are placed inside of our school. So I can refer to them. We'll kind of go back and forth sometimes, refer between us depending on the need. Then I'll also refer outside of school to agencies that can provide the type of services that the student needs. So in that way, sometimes I function as a entry point for um, students to experience mental health care, or behavioral health, and then get to the, the place where they're gonna get their needs met maybe better than what I can do in that moment. I refer to medical a lot for reproductive health or also because sometimes students come to us, they've never, come for medical or dental, they might, similar to the example Jen gave, be new to the area um, and come in from behavioral health services. And I'm able to screen, have you usually my first visit, when's the last time you've had a medical visit? Um, have you been to the dentist? Do you have vision care? I screen for all of that. And, and it happens that they'll say, no, I haven't gone to the dentist in a couple years and I'll be able to make that referral within our team for them to get that care that they might be needing. Um, also the different youth groups and programs at the schools, either within our health center or at the school with partners, I can see who, which students I'm in contact with who'd be a good fit for those programs. And... Yeah, I think that is most of what I planned to say. So thank you. I'll pass it on to, I believe, Etsy is going to be 
sharing about dental next. Yeah. Yes. So we weren't able to get our dental provider to be able to be here with us today, but we did want to make sure that we include dental um, as part of this presentation because they are such a big part of our team um, and they are a big part of being able to access uh, it, entry into accessing other health and services within our health center. Um, so we have a case study on the dental care. We had a 10 year old Hispanic female uh, who came in initially for a dental exam and she was actually referred through a dental screening event at school. So kind of when Amy was mentioning, like it's not just about the clinical services that we offer, but also like more of like a population health, public health model that we also are able to uh, host within our school-based health centers. And so on a yearly basis, all of our school-based sites offer school-wide dental screenings um, to all students on site, on campus, whether they have dental insurance or not. And it's just a really great way for us to promote um, oral health education, for us to be able to identify any students that may be in need of dental care and for us to really make sure that parents know that we are offering dental services on site. So this student came to us um, and after an exam, uh, the provider did find out, uh, did create a treatment plan because the student hadn't been to the dentist in a while uh, and needed cleaning. Uh, so can you go into the next piece, Tommy? So she created a treatment plan in terms of dental cleaning, fluoride varnish. Uh, there was some dental extractions that needed to happen. So Dr. Kashafi, who is our dental provider, reviewed this plan with the parents um, to coordinate serv ongoing services with in our school-based health center. Next slide. So from the initial time that this patient came to us, uh, this patient received a total of 18 dental visits for treatment and then she was being able to get ongoing care for the last five years. Um, but the really key piece that we wanted to highlight was this that the family was then also able to receive dental care with us and we were able to integrate our services to expand to the whole family. So the patient then came along with two other siblings and established ongoing dental care. And because this particularly happened at a site that has community access and is open to community members. Even though this particular student left the school because of the great care that they received and because of the rapport that they were able to build with our dental provider, they still kept coming to the school site for dental care services. So we just really wanted to make sure that we also highlighted our dental services. And so I believe next, Tawny is going to be talking about supporting integrating care within your school sites. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tani Camacho. I am the program manager for our, one of our school-based health centers here in Oakland under Native American Health Center. Um, and the site that I manage um, is two different campuses that are within the, the school grounds. Um, so it, one is a middle school, the other one is a middle school and high school. Um, both are very different in the way that they operate and um, the way that, uh, you know, they're managed. So just being very mindful and aware of the differences of those two schools. Um, but yet we serve very similar populations. Um, so it's very unique um, at this site. So just to share a little bit more about these additional things that we can do to incorporate into integrated care. You know, we talked about the medical portions, behavioral health, medical, um, but there's all these other elements that we um, should be mindful as well of. And so I'm gonna touch on some of those. Um, and we have youth groups, you know, we've touched, Amy's talked about them, and schools have youth groups that are already existing, but also as school-based health centers. That's something that we can offer um, additional to either youth groups that are already existing. A lot of schools tend to have some um, that are more academically focused when it comes to their youth groups or either just supporting young people in their academic um, pathways in school. Um, so there's groups that are existing at, at schools that are, you know, joven nobles, Latino men and boys that really just support, you know, uh, young people, young men that identify as Latino um, with, you know, the school support, um, African-American male achievement programs, things like that. But 
as a health center, we can also facilitate youth groups. So these can be facilitated either by health educators that you have, therapists, your clinic program managers or supervisors, interns, some of our sites, we also have interns that come on board, um, other work study program staff such as AmeriCorps, or you can also connect with local organizations, local youth organizations that are in your areas, because a lot of times they are also having objectives that they need to meet and they have the staff capacity for these groups, but sometimes are lacking the space or a captive audience, which you have within the school. Um, so it is a great way to network and utilize existing resources that are in your community. So, Topics for youth groups. This again depends on the needs that you have within your um, community, your school community um, and participants because each of your participants is very unique to the next. So just making sure that you are incorporating um, staff, uh, sorry, student input into things that are covered in your groups. Um, and they can be really broad type youth groups such as a young woman's circle or a young, men, young men's group, um, of course, more kudos and more participation if you are creative with your names because that definitely increases um, the curiosity and wanting to participate in your groups. Um, but when you have these broad groups that you definitely have way more of a flexibility on the, the topics that you're able to cover. So you can cover things around self esteem, social um, network building, nutrition, cooking demonstrations, relationships, um, communication, anger management, sexual health, list can go on and on with these broad group names and what you can cover. Um, but there's also times that you need to tailor your youth groups to having a specific health or wellness um, topic, such as a grief circle or social emotional support, alcohol and other drug prevention. And these are also things that you will, um, will get feedback from the schools that you're working with. Um, We've noted though that a 10 week model tends to work really well for the needs of, of participants, but also with your um, relationship that you have with the school, you know, students being in class and being in their seats are something that the school definitely wants to have. Um, but you can find ways to still have students participate in your groups while they're in the school. So being creative in the times that you pull students out, whether it be during PE or an elective unit, um, those have definitely been the best times to pull students. And you tend to get more, uh, less of a pushback from the school. Um, so also having it be a 10 week, eight to 10 week model has shown that also you have less of an, an objection from schools of students missing too much time, even if it's during PE or electives. Um, but as Amy mentioned as well, having like the passes and those type of systems in place to make sure that students are not marked absent um, from those classes. Um, so whether it be by passes or, you know, something that's already been uh, existing that you have developed with the teacher. Um, so that way they know that those students are in your class, in your group. Oh, what happened here? Sorry. Having a technical issue. It's not showing me on my next one. Oh, here we go. Okay. So grants. Grants are very fun and also um, way to, to expand on services that you have or to bring in additional resources to your site. Um, these can be done either through state, federal, or local funding that you um, can find. Um, there's so many different topics that are available for grants. So nutrition, trauma, substance abuse, um, substance prevention, anger management, food insecurities. It is so many uh, possibilities that are out there. So it does sometimes take some finding and digging and, and the time to apply um, and to get your funding. Um, but the possibilities of what can come out of grants are amazing. Um, it is a great way, like I said, for you to bring in additional things to your site or also to just kind of grow with some of the, the existing services that you already have. Um, it's a great way as well for certain grants that are able to create additional revenue to, to support another staff. Um, so paying for another staff role for your organization. Um, just also being mindful that many times, you know, grants can be um, a little bit more than what you may be able to take on at the time. So just being aware of the capacities that you have. So if you're starting 
you know, completely from scratch and opening up your school-based health center, um, just not wanting to take on something that you don't have the staff capacity for or the space, um, because some of these things do require either having staffing or um, additional things that you may not have. Um, but as I mentioned, it is just a great way to, to increase. Um, so if there's something that you already have, maybe you have started doing just like health education around nutrition, um, but there's a grant that's out there that can help you bring in a nutritionist. That was something that we were able to do at our site um, and we were able to expand on our youth group. So we were able to bring the nutritionist who is doing a curriculum for six weeks with 10 students um, in different cohorts. So we're really targeting the six Sixth graders to make healthy decision making around sugary um, beverage intake and just sugary snacks. Um, so definitely the, there's so many possibilities with grants and what you can do for your site. Um, and a lot of this is also things that you can do to expand with the the feedback that you're getting from your school site. So school administrators um, and school faculty definitely are key people um, and can help to, to drive the way that you move towards for grants, um, depending on the needs that the schools have at that moment. Um, so an example of uh, something that can be kind of led by the school is one of our school sites. Um, is a combination of middle school and high school. And they had a lot of um, AOD substance use um, that was happening on school grounds, as well as you know just students engaging in, in um, alcohol and drugs. And so they definitely had a high need for some type of, of substance abuse prevention, which our health center was not at the capacity to do so, but we definitely helped to drive and bring um, a program that was available to, to support those um, needs for the school. And again, that was because of the communication that we have and the close um, partnership that, that the health center has with the school and the school faculty. And that leads me to the outreach and networking. The importance of, of getting to know your school site and getting to know the school personnel um, not only will you get to see the needs that the staff have, because again, you are also supporting the staff um, in their own wellness. Um, you know, staff are unable to feel well about themselves. And again, they're not going to support young people to the best of their ability. So making sure that you're supporting staff, getting to know them. Um, and they also will be key in knowing some of the needs that the students, student body and the families are having at that time and how you can continue to support. So definitely get on school listservs, attend staff development meetings and other staff events um, because you want them to get to know you not only as a professional in the healthcare world, um, but a lot of times too, they might ne not necessarily see you as their um, colleague like in this good fight that we are doing to support young people. Um, so you definitely wanna mix and mingle with your school staff and attending as many student things, you know, your students are your main population that you are serving. So you definitely want to be a familiar face and an approachable face to young people to be able to come with whatever needs that they have. Um, so as mentioned, you know, the importance of having like open house events, um, doing these fun type of activities like at lunchtime for the youth engagement, um, doing school wide testing events that um, can be done to bring in young people. So either whether it be a dental screening or something else that's uh, more medical focused around HIV and, and um, STI testing. So one thing that we have is our tacos and testing event where young people, um, we are, are booked for medical appointments. They come in, they are uh, screened for HIV and STI. They also receive one-on-one -on -one health education with our provider um, in this kind of rapid model. Um, but then we bring them back to do a more, um, more lengthier appointment and, and connect them with the services that they may need. But the incentive for them to do this is also that they receive a taco, tacos, so taco and testing, and it's become a really fun event that our high school and middle school students look forward to participating in. Um, and so anything that you can do to create visibility in a way, and the great thing about that as well is destigmatizing some of these type of testing. Um, so making sure that they see that the importance of, of getting tested and you know, knowing their status. Um, so making sure that you are also just being, like I said, visible for the young people. So either doing class presentations, things like that. Um, 
tapping into some of the existing youth groups so you can bring them in to do these mini visits um, with some of the existing um, groups or you know recently now is doing a lot of the um, virtual kind of pop-ins um, Last week, I was able to do a queer um, health rights workshop for our GSA group. So things like that of, you know, making sure that you are being as, as much as you can. And we do know, you know, again, it is difficult for one person to do that. So spreading that out with your staff that is at your site, um, as well as connecting and participating in staff um, no, I'm sorry, not staff, parent events. So PTU, PTA nights, registration, definitely being at registration is key because you are someone that is there right from the beginning of their youth experience, of their school experience for both families and students. Um, so attending the registrations, um, even the things like coffee with the principal, sports award nights, anything that you can do again to increase your, your visibility within the school is great for rapport that you have with students and families. Um, and then making sure that you're connecting to the resources that are within your community, um, especially if you're starting out from scratch. You know, there's so many things that are out there to support you um, in your community that you do not have to kind of create the wheel, um, but really tapping into those resources that you may have. So getting to know whatever is out there for food um, insecurities, um, for other youth organizations, and how you guys can continue to support each other um, and see what you know, you may have that's similar um, to offer more to your school site. So um, it is great to definitely schmooze, schmooze, schmooze. That is a key thing. And be creative. There is so many things that your staff already have that you have as well, not only on your personal uh, professional self, but we all have our own personal lives and we all have our own personal strengths that we bring. Um, so definitely be creative, utilize the resources that you have. Um, like I said, your staff bring with them a wealth of knowledge and skills. So an example of, of this photo is that, you know, if your therapist is already trained in martial arts, then they can bring something and they can I have my timer to, to kind of keep myself on time. Um, so if your therapist is already trained in martial arts and they can help teach us a, a self-defense class for either students or parents. Um, so if your health educator loves to cook, then they can teach a food is medicine class. Um, there is so many possibilities of what can be done. So again, remember that it takes time to build and grow. Be patient um, with every youth work and everything that you do is, you know, there's always going to be ebbs and flows. And we see this definitely right now in times of COVID of how we have adapted and made changes to our ways of operating. Um, so know that everything takes flexibility and that, you know, you are not alone. As Amy said, there's so many the things that we can tap into as resources. There's other um, organizations that are happy to assist you on this road that you are on. Um, so reach out, be creative, um, and, and enjoy the path that you have to creating your school-based health center. Um, and that is my piece. And next I'm going to pass it to our kind of wrap up to Atsidi. Thank you, Tani. So as y'all can see, uh, there's a lot of partnership, a lot of collaboration that happens between health center staff on site uh, within disciplines and also with a lot of collaboration that happens with school health center or with school health center staff and school administration and other community organizations to really create a strong system of integrated services. So what are some of the best, best practices that we have learned in creating this uh, strong system of care? So staff cross-training is really, really important. It's really important for staff on site to really know what services are being offered by your behavior health provider, what services is being provided by the medical provider. And one of the things that we've done is, you know, Terezia mentioned the warm handoffs. We've, we've practiced within our department meetings how to do a warm handoff. How does a provider do a warm handoff to um, the behavior health provider? How does the front desk person do a warm handoff to even the medical provider or the dentist? Because it may sound really easy, um, but in practice, you know, it, you might stumble. And so it's really important that we get comfortable with doing our warm handoffs. 
if you can, you know, schedules vary by health center and clinic. So we found that scheduling multiple services on one day has been really useful. Um, when we have medical and dental services going on at the same time, it's really easy for some of our families who are, are already taking, you know, the beauty of school-based health centers is that families don't have to miss too much time from work. However, if they are going to a school site where the parent wants to be a part of the visit as well, you know, we can do a medical and dental appointment all in one day and it eliminates the time that the parent has to take away from work um, or trying to find child care elsewhere. In terms of our medical and behavioral health, especially with shared patients, it's really great for a medical provider and a, our behavioral health clinician to have the time to really check in in person, do a case consultation on the shared patients that they have. Like Tawny mentioned, building strong relationships with school staff and administration is so important um, for when we are trying to create those resources for them, when we are trying to establish groups and trying to pull students and trying to do dental screenings. It's really great to have really good rapport uh, with school administration because it makes those types of events easier to plan and manage. Um, and knowledge of community resources, you know, it's great that school-based health centers are a one-stop shop, but we also know that we also need support and we also all can't do it all. And so who are the people in our community? Who are the people um, in our bubble who are also champions of health equity who can really help and support us in the work that we do? Um, and building time to rapport uh, with patients and families. That is really key. If the patient feels comfortable coming to the health center, if the parent feels comfortable with themselves or their child going to the health center, you know, it's just gonna create really strong, um, it's gonna create really, it's gonna create a strong partnership within that family and then they're just gonna keep trusting you to keep on coming back for services. And I think that is really key. Um, but with best practices, there's also lessons learned. Um, and so Jen is going to support. Hi, hi everybody again. Um, thanks, it's Siri. So I think as Amy, or at Siri, maybe both of you mentioned earlier, it's really a matter of trial and error. You just have to start doing things and figuring out what works, which we've been doing for a really long time. And so there are a number of things that we've sort of figured out work and don't work. Um, around the issues of sustainability and billing for your services. Um, unfortunately, it is a, an artifact of a Medi-Cal system that you cannot bill for a medical visit and a behavioral health service on the same day. <clears throat> Excuse me, so if a patient has an appointment with the nurse practitioner um, and the behavioral health clinician on one day, you will only get paid for one of those services which is really a shame, it's, it's too bad for the kids because sometimes it can be more helpful. On the other hand, the point is we're school-based and they can sort of easily come back and forth, but it's important to know when you think about um, making sure that your services are sustainable. Um, strong internal systems and workflows are needed to support integrated care. I think as this sort of echoes what Siri mentioned about like, um, practicing warm handoffs and um, making sure that everybody, you know, it, it's really a team sport providing care at these school, all healthcare is, but at, particularly at school based clinics, making sure everybody knows their part, knows their steps in the dance. And it's particularly challenging when you're working with a partner site because um, you, I know from a medical provider's point of view, we uh, don't have the benefit of um, chart sharing and systems sharing um, so that there's a lot of um, additional work that we need to do to share information to make sure that our uh, work is connecting to the benefit of the patient in the end. Um, and to that point, you need to invest time for your staff to be able to talk to each other and work together. The providers for sure, but everybody all together in that it is a team and it is a dance, any given student, patient, family member, moving through the health clinic on any given day is gonna to touch multiple people. And you wanna make sure everybody knows um, what to do and how to do it. Be aware of staff and resource limitations, as it's Siri, I think alluded to in the last slide. Um, you know, 
our native scythe provide a really high level of integrated care and still do not come close to meeting all the needs that our patients present with. And so being aware of what you can and cannot do um, and when you're gonna have to rely on partners to help you out is really important. It's particularly important when you think about what things you want to screen for. This is something actually we presented on last year at the conference was um, social determinative health screening. And it's important to know, for example, before you start screening everybody for food insecurity, to have uh, known resources for where you can help people get connected to food. If you're going to be working on that with them, you need to make sure. And obviously that's not something that most medical clinics, most school-based clinics, uh, usually don't come to the table with those resources. So that's a, uh, uh, been a really powerful partnership for us is working with the Alameda County Food Bank to make sure that we have those sort of resources available for our patients when they need them. And of course, we all accept this, and it's one of the delights actually of working on a school-based team and our school-based team is that we accept and um, enjoy the fact that integrated care is a continued work in process and we're all learning all the time. Um, and, uh, and, and enjoy that aspect of our work. So I think now it goes back to Amy, is that right? For questions and answers? Yeah, right, I think we, we have some great questions that I think for the full team. Um, so I can read those off and we can see who wants to answer them. Um, we have three so far. One of them, um, I think it's for you all, is how are you able to continue seeing alumni? I had assumed that if they are no longer a student, they could not receive services. So maybe you guys want to answer that and then I'll, I'll try and offer a bigger picture. Yeah, um, for being able to see alumni, it really depends on the school site um, and whether it's not a school-based health center that is able to serve a larger community. So there are some school-based health centers that, you know, really target just the school, the students on that campus up until the time that they are there. Um, and that has to do a lot with the, the partnership that we have with the schools and the school administrators um, in terms of patient uh, student safety and staff safety. They don't just want a random adult going in during lunchtime, right? Um, but a lot of the times the sites that we're able to see alumni are in health centers that are actually set up with a community entrance door uh, that's not even associated within the school-based site, so you don't even have to enter through the school um, in order to access services, or there uh, are school-linked services, um, sorry, at our school-linked sites. So these are the ones that are completely away from the health center, maybe across the street, maybe next door. Um, and so what we do tend to happen is even at the sites where, say, at our Skyline High School, that is only a site where we only see students at that school site, once they graduate, they are more than welcome to access services at one of our maybe school linked community sites because our providers change. The provider doesn't stay with that one site. One, the same provider can maybe be at three different sites. And so if they really like the rapport that they build with that provider and our provider is at a school linked site, um, they can then still continue their care with them, but just in a different location. Great, and I'll just, I'll just um, mirror that and say that yes, uh, um, over 80% of school-based health centers do serve some population beyond just the students, and oftentimes alumni um, are the, the first population they'll add on if they have capacity to do so because they want that continuity of care. Um, and you know, depending on the provider types that they have, there sometimes there's an age limit, or they start asking them to transition to a broader community clinic once they hit 25. Um, but it is um, it is pretty common to see school based health centers serving alumni and a broader community. Like it's Jerry mentioned, often depending on the relationship with the school and whether there's an outside entrance. Um, we have a few other questions, and I'm going to pivot one because it's sort of a follow up on that, which is how do you safeguard confidential services for youth when the sites are open to the broader community? So again, it's Yuri and team, do you guys want to start? Yeah, I think one of the things that we try and best do um, 
it does, it definitely does get tricky, but I think having designated set days where it's only like youth only or community only, um, this is something that we've actually had a challenge with, you know, when we first opened one of our school sites, it, we really were seeing more adolescents, but over time, more families started going. Um, and so we were really looking at changing the, the framework and our schedule to just be certain days of just adolescents, confidential services only, and then on other days having, um, being more open to larger community and it could be full days it could be mornings only families afternoons only um, adolescents uh, it really varies but that's one of the ways that we have worked around that piece and I think it's an important question to think about how you're maintaining confidentiality regardless of who your population is right because you really want even if you just have students you really want students to feel like other students are going to keep their information confidential so I've seen school health centers do a lot of great strategies around that trying to destigmatize accessing um, services of the school health center by saying you know people come here for lots of reasons they come here to go to the dentist they come here for their immunizations, they come here for therapy, they come here for sexual and reproductive health services, and just trying to, to um, you know, make it like not a big deal. Everyone comes to the health center for lots of reasons. It doesn't have any like meaning behind it. I've seen signs up in school-based health centers saying like, we don't ask this here and, and encouraging other students to not ask each other like, what are you here for? Or that sort of thing, you know, like let's maintain everyone's privacy and confidentiality. Um, just really good to creative strategies of saying like, yeah, this is, this is your private, you don't need to, to share that information. And Jen, it looks like maybe you want to add something. Yeah, I had a, a thought about that. One thing we've ha had to do in the past couple years in um, our clinics is to make it a um, no cell phone zone because our kids are so uh, in the waiting room, particularly kids are so adept with their phones taking pictures and they don't even think about it. They're just sort of like Snapchatting all the day, all the time, whatever's around them. They're not even aware of where they're pointing the phone. It's not necessarily, um, you know, malicious or they're not trying to call anybody out, but they can expose other people even without intending it. So one of the things we've tried to do for kids is to make sure that they understand this is like a no phone zone. It really has to stay in your bag um, so that everybody feels safe and feels protected while they're there. That's a great point. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, and Amy, one of the things that you were mentioning is like uh, usually most of our school-based health center sites offer tours at the beginning of the school year. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that uh, we are very clear with our students and be like, look, this is our health center. We offer medical, dental, behavioral health. There's people here that you could come and check in when you're just not feeling well, or maybe you need to take a break from class and this is the space. And because we offer all of that information, we do enclose the like, you can't just make an assumption that someone's here for a pregnancy test. You know, they could probably hear for the dentist, you know, they're probably here because they just wanted to, you know, I, I tell them like we run an internship program. So they're probably here because they might be turning in an assignment that they had for me. You just never know. And so I think that being upfront with students at the very beginning about that and also about the confidentiality piece, um, like Jen mentioned, also even at the beginning of all of our appointments, um, I think helps reinforce and, helps students feel secure in coming to the health center. Thank you. The next question is school-based health centers using community health workers. I can't answer that one. <laughs> um, community health workers are such an essential thing that we actually, uh, one of our lessons learned through um, a grant that just ended is the importance of having a community health worker because they are also a key person within the school. They help with a lot of like the, um, the communication between and, and just really serve as a liaison, I think a lot of times, not only to the school, um, but as well just to community resources, like the name is, um, right, community health worker. So they can um, really bring in a lot of additional support um, and so if you have a community health worker that is amazing like I said I think that's one of our lessons learned through this grant is just how key that role it plays within school-based health centers. I would second that. I think that the most successful school health centers have someone in that kind of role to be that bridge, to be that liaison, to run a youth engagement program, to do community health 
education, campaigns, outreach, all sorts of exciting things. This is often the sort of soft costs that we were talking before that aren't covered by billable visits. Um, Family Pact can actually will reimburse for health educators. So oftentimes a community health outreach worker can serve as a clinical health educator and bill Family Pact, but that reimbursement is much lower and that won't pay for their visit. Um, we've seen some sites use um, AmeriCorps interns, and that's a creative way of getting someone in that role for a lower cost. But of course, that, that position then turns over every year. So there's sort of pros and cons there. Um, but I would second Tani in saying that that's, that's really essential for success. Um, so here's a great one. What type of data do you collect to measure success? And I think actually in Alameda County, which Native American Health Centers is, they have a really amazing um, data collection system that a lot of folks don't have. So do you guys wanna start with that and then I can try and piggyback. Yeah, so like Amy said, we're very fortunate. And so all school health centers in Alameda County um, have UCSF as our evaluators. Um, and so they really support in gathering all the information in terms of all of our unduplicated patients, um, what services we're providing, uh, everything from parent engagement, youth engagement, everything from clinical operations. Um, you know, a lot of us here in Alameda County just recently transitioned to our electronic health record system them of EPIC. Um, so they've been really taking the lead and really making sure and working with our EPIC Ocean to making sure like how can they pull the data already from the charts without having to do extra data entry in the past before you know every type of patient contact that we had we had to document it into um, something what we called an ETO form back in the day um, that captured patient demographics and also reasons of visits. So it's really nice that we do have the support from our UCSF evaluators and at the end of each school year, they go ahead and compile the data um, and let us know what we're doing, how well we're doing it, um, how are we doing, are we better off for, by offering these services and in comparison from years prior. So, um, and they take data from every segment, like I said, medical, dental, behavioral health, um, and all the other parts of youth engagement and community engagement. Great. And, and can, that is, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say we can, there's, a, a theory referenced our, um, our um, electronic health records, and we use that too, independently of the UCSF data to um, focus on clinical measurements that we want to pay attention to and improve. We look at, you know, what are best practices across adolescent care in particular for us. Um, a couple years ago, we decided we wanted to increase and make sure that every single uh, student got a depression screen. And now we're able to um, we chart that and we're able to look at that and to mark our progress on, on the route to that as a sort of standard of care. So uh, there are also abilities as we move forward with um, electronic capture of clinical care provided to be able to um, focus on particular um, outcomes and um, measurements that you want to look at and track them yourself. That's a really great point. And, and clinically, it really is a best practice to think about what kind of screening you feel like is most important. And a lot of school-based health centers have launched, as Native was talking about, depression screens, um, trauma, anxiety, um, suicidality, um, a broader sort of social determinants of health screening. So, you know, it is possible to like have a screening burden on the patient, right? You don't want to be doing 10 screenings at a visit, but I think it's really important to think about what clinical measures you most want to be measuring and then having a validated screen that you use with all students say once a year. Um, and that can be a great source of data. Um, and ideally you do have, would have some kind of evaluation system, even if it's not outsourced the way that Alameda County is lucky enough to have. And that's one of the things that we help you find or help you partner with someone or help you see like a best way to track some of that. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to do these ones um, a little quickly. Um, one question is, if we have existing wellness counselors, can we build a school-based health center and use additional resources but keep our school staff as wellness counselors? And the answer there is absolutely. Um, hopefully one of the things you took away from today is that 
the more integration you have, the more you can pull from different parts of your community and different service providers and um, different resources, the better, because you want to bring as much resource together as you can. So that would be perfect. And you, of course, not would not want to get rid of um, a resource that's working and that's supporting your students. Can I tell so that, you that? Yeah, yeah, please. I was just going to say, I think, yes to that. It's great. But I would highly recommend having um, someone in the wellness counselors who, someone um, to really learn about the medical model of behavioral health and how to integrate because they could just be operating totally, totally separately is, is probably would be the default of what would happen. And that's not going to um, take advantage of all the opportunities of having both there on site. The, the, when I switched from more community mental health to medical model mental health, it was very different. I learned a whole new language, totally different types of screeners and acronyms and billing. I mean, it's just very, very different. So if you're able to have someone who understands those two different systems and how they can work together, that is a huge help. That's just what I want to say. Yeah. I love that point. And as you heard Theresia talk about earlier, you can have different mental or behavioral health providers working in conjunction with each other. And oftentimes, actually, that's the best case scenario is maybe you have someone like Theresia working under this medical model who might see a larger group of people for fewer visits for mild to moderate symptoms, but then for someone who needs weekly psychotherapy, have someone who doesn't bill under the medical model and can see someone and have a much smaller caseload for a much longer time. So you have sort of different levels of providers or different kinds of providers that can cross refer to each other depending on the student need. Um, Cause you know, again, sort of the more the better here. Um, but it does bring up what the next person brings up, which is how are you navigating between HIPAA and FERPA? And I'll just say that that is so complicated that we have a whole toolkit online and a whole workshop just on that. So it's really important as you're bringing together people who are employees of the school or the school district and people who are employees of a health center or healthcare provider, there are going to be things to negotiate and understand about how they can share information from each other that are way too complicated to get into in our last four minutes. So check out the resources on the website and the primer and the workshop to better understand how those two laws sort of fit together. Oh, such good questions. Um, the last two are, are all services free of cost and absolutely a best practice that we see for School Based Health Center is that all services be free of cost. I believe all the services at Native American Health Centers are. Yes, Terry. Great. Yes, they're free um, of the cost or, you know, obviously financial sustainability, we always try and find a billing source that we can, whether it's their Medi-Cal, whether it's minor consent Medi-Cal, family packed, um, but yes, all of our services are free. And that's true, not for every single one of the school based officers in California, but almost every single one. Can I say something to that real quick also? Yeah. It's yeah. Just, it would run into challenges with the sustainability if um, the, a lot of our, the population in our schools have Medi-Cal insurance, but if there are, are a lot of students that have private insurance or if they have Kaiser, even if it's Kaiser Medi-Cal, we, we're not able to serve them in the same way or we have to tell them, please go to Kaiser. So there are those hiccups in care because we are, um, if there, might, there might be grants or other funding, but we are insurance billing. That's a good point. Thank you, Therese. That is also where a community health worker is great to have on your team because they're able to help navigate these outside resources and outside service um, areas that sometimes we do not have the capacity to do so. So sometimes that will fall on either, you know, your like clinic supervisor, your program manager, or like I said, for the sites that are lucky enough to have a community health worker to have someone to help with that as well. Um, and that also is, you know, there are gaps in, in insurance for some of the families, you know, they don't meet their deadline, things like that. Um, so a lot of that is another piece um, for our sustainability is making sure that we are assisting families to keep their insurance active or to help out with certain cases at times that there's glitches in the system. Um, and that is also getting to know these outside things that are there of like the Medi-Cal world. So <laughs> maybe a whole nother training in itself about Medi-Cal oh, world. <laughs> Um, and CPCA, our wonderful partners, um, do lots of great trainings, and we can do them and partner with them around billing. Um, I'm going to wrap us up because it's 1.58, and the system does close it, too. Um, so we have our Mary had a quick question about how do you, if you have a behavioral health and a medical 
same day, how do you decide which to bill? And I'll just say, Mary, it doesn't matter because you're going to get the same. If you're a federally qualified health center, you're going to get the same reimbursement for both. So it doesn't actually matter. You just pick one. Um, and uh, I want to give a really, really big thank you to our friends at Native American Health Center for taking time to present to us today. I want to remind folks that you'll get an email with the evaluation for today, um, and you will get entered into a raffle if you do your evaluation each day. I mean, each day is a different raffle. Um, and tomorrow we have two amazing plenaries, one to start the day and one to end. We have two sets of shorter workshops. They're sort of less deeper dives tomorrow, but really compelling still and two different brain breaks, I think kickboxing and hip hop. So show up tomorrow um, and enjoy the whole day. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us. I hope you had a good first day of our three day conference. Phew, 159. Thank you thank, to everybody. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Have a great conference.